you can okay so basically we are live right. and the but what i do is i ask the person to introduce themselves because that's a yeah. i feel it's a nicer way to go about it because they'll be mm. able to give out more accurate information so yeah. jawad thank you very much for coming in here we've had a beautiful conversation in in conversation with a beautiful mind i loved it with anis if she's watching or whenever she watches thank you very much and she's please introduce <laughs> <laughs> okay so she should have come in why didn't she come in <laughs> no she doesn't want to <laughs> okay i'll anyway send she her says, the <laughs> she says every time i overshadow you so this time you you mean the live like no no i'm sending her the zoom link if she comes in okay. it's good but uh, okay. otherwise it's Fine. okay this is one jawa this is one of those opportunities where you yeah. get this opportunity to talk without me saying anything so take full advantage of it you won't get all these opportunities again no the problem with vikram is that you want me to introduce myself my problem is i'm a very modest guy <laughs> so uh, uh okay you know that uh, that was said in a lighter way but okay uh what can i say about myself except that uh, i'm i'm very passionate about mediation and uh, uh i have been a mediator since 2006 2007 uh, i've been a lawyer for about 33 years and uh, i found that there was something missing and i found that missing link when i discovered mediation so i am now a passionate advocate of mediation so uh, i am a trainer i am a mediator practicing mediator so uh, i am a part of adr odr international and uh, my partner in kdl x chambers llp uh, which is based in gurgaon we offer mediation services and the adr odr international is one of the uh, top mediation companies in the world uh, it has a presence in about 35 countries so that's about it nothing much <laughs> that's why i didn't want to go into it i would have given a much larger introduction but thank you very much i see you can so please your presentation <laughs> okay so uh, well i thought you're going to ask me questions vikram we'll do that later first whatever i mean you've gone through the theme of the symposium so yeah. whatever you want to take us through i'm here i'm here i mean we'll definitely uh, we'll talk about it okay so actually i i uh, i i thought we are going to have more of a conversation because you you hate the webinar type of speeches and all that so <laughs> i was more prepared for that so oh, yeah. no, no, you are sure you you're, you, you're a speak, trainer you're a trainer yeah. you can okay if you want me to speak then the problem will be that it will be like a presentation so <laughs> as much as that as much as that i will, i mean i won't want to stop you like i said for me that part okay. of it is one of those opportunities i have to give people to talk also <laughs> okay now here's what uh, i mean uh, culture and traditions is what uh, you are talking about so basically what uh, what i personal i i'll just tell you my personal beliefs and uh, uh, there was this book i was reading you know uh, human kind of hopeful history by rudyard bregman and he paints a very very positive picture of humanity that basically uh, we human beings we survived uh because of our inherent empathy and that is how we were able to survive where the neanderthals who were much stronger than us and much more uh intelligent than us also could not survive and he presents some archaeological evidence to show that and he also gives many examples where you know in the face of adversity human beings have acted with a lot of uh, empathy and a lot of uh, understanding and trying to help each other so my belief is that i think uh, basically as human beings we don't like conflict uh conflict uh, as we understand it today essentially is uh, rooted in two things one is greed and the other is jealousy uh otherwise the conflict that arises due to emotions like anger and other things uh is something that is more on a personal level which uh, might be a reaction to a situation but most of our present day conflict whether it is commercial whether it is uh, uh, contractual or whatever you may call it or or for that matter even you know uh, family disputes uh, i think they are ba- based on uh, two very important things greed and jealousy and we became greedy and we started becoming jealous only when we started uh, 
uh, from hunters and gatherers we transition to the to becoming agriculturists and that is where you know the, the idea of possession and having property and owning of land and uh, ownership concept all these things came in at that stage so if you look back you know, even even today if you visit some of these primitive tribes which are living so called primitive tribes uh, for example the bushmen of uh, africa or or even in our own tribal cultures uh, because i was attending a, a webinar organized by maharashtra national law university where uh, uh, an ngo which used to work which works for tribals so the head of the ngo was talking about how tribals don't believe in going to courts so they always sit have a dialogue and resolve the disputes so essentially what uh, my feeling is that uh, we basically we we the, the best way that we can think of of resolving conflicts is through the process of dialogue through the process of a conversation with each other uh, so that has been a tradition not just for india but uh, overall for humanity as such so we have been mostly having these conversations having these dialogues now if you uh, watch uh, william uri's ted talk uh, he talks about uh, the bushmen of the sahara or somewhere where you know when the, whenever there is a problem somebody goes and hides the poison arrows because they hunt with poison arrows you know poison uh, arrows dipped in uh, with the tips dipped in poison so there somebody goes and hides the poison arrows and then they sit across with each other in a circle and they talk and they talk and they talk until they are able to find a solution and uh, william uri says that even if the if still the tempers are running high then the person who's most angry is sent away somewhere uh, for a cooling down period and then he comes back and then the conversation begins and the disputes are resolved and that's how we have been doing for ages and uh, there is enough evidence of that i think in our old uh, you know you know mythology as well as in our old uh, historical documents uh, that we have so when and where did we change that is the question so of course we changed when we started becoming you know owners so ownership uh, brought about greed ownership brought about jealousy okay now uh, i i hope it doesn't sound too philosophical but <laughs> this is what my understanding is uh, not much of a philosopher though uh, so that is when it started and then we had uh, religions coming okay and religions especially the abrahamic religions if you look at christianity if you look at islam uh, they have this concept of uh, sin you know uh, so uh if for, uh, now what happened was uh, how our legal system started off uh, i think we over to the hobbesian concept of you know man uh, being basically a savage and uh, to control that savagery you need somebody who is an authority who has to you know a leviathan who tells the uh, who controls uh, those uh, savage impulses of uh, humanity uh that is how the concept of a government and you know uh, a legislature the judiciary and all these things started coming up uh, i think we can relate it back to that time when these ideas started coming up uh so with the with the start of all these things we then you know as society advanced the industrial revolution happened and uh, we started having these court systems and uh, britain and other european powers started expanding and colonizing the so called uncivilized countries and uh, giving their brand of civilization and uh, through this brand of civilization came the system of the courts now the problem with us is we we are clinging on so hard to these uh, vestiges of colonialism that we believe that the, that is the only way to resolve our disputes so the the idea of having a conversation of having a dialogue uh to resolve conflict that has somehow you know uh, been submerged uh in this uh, overwhelming tide of a uh, 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 sort of a you know straight jacketed legal system and uh, now what this legal system basically does uh, is it defines your rights and your obligations and it defines how you can 
agitate those rights. So I read somewhere uh, an interesting definition of justice. It says, uh, let me just recollect because uh, the exercise of authority for the vindication of a right by assigning reward or punishment. So if you look at this definition, inherent, uh, inherently you will find you know, that there is authority and uh, there is right and there is punishment. So for all this, you need the law. So we developed a sort of a formula. So the saying that, you know, this is what is the right, because uh, we uh, initially in Britain, they wanted to separate the church and the state. And so what they did was uh, the concept of positive uh, law came about. Uh, so it cannot be the divine law, but it has to be a positive law, which is framed by the state. So they took away God's right to frame the laws. So, <laughs> of course, in the Muslim community, we still follow the Sharia law. We still say that you know, we, we still follow God's law. So that way we are, we are stuck in a, in a 1,500 year old paradigm. Now, I don't want to go into that controversy, but what I'm trying to say is uh, we came up with the separation of church and the state and we started uh, establishing these institutions, the so-called just institutions, institutions of justice. So we have an institution that lays down the law uh, we have an institution that enforces the law and uh, we have an institution that interprets the law and uh, all these, you know, the, 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 tri the three arms of the state. So we have the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. So the difficulty here is uh, if you talk about your rights, it has to fall within the four corners of what the law says are your rights. It cannot go beyond that. So it is stuck over there. And uh, the way you establish the right is also prescribed. So you have to follow that particular procedure. And uh, if you are unable to follow the procedure or you are unable to prove your right in the manner that the law recognizes, it's as if you don't have the right. It's as good as you not having the right. Now, when you look at uh, justice delivered in this manner, justice according to law. So though we say fiat us TTR, what kind of, uh, if you look at this concept of uh, justice, let justice be done though the heavens may fall. Is justice really done? Because there seems to be a difference between justice according to law and justice as felt by the people. And this is what Amartya Sen also talks in his book, Idea of Justice. So here the, this dichotomy comes, this problem comes that justice according to law does not always translate into uh, justice according to uh, what people feel is right. So Many people don't understand the law. Okay, though we say ignorantia juris non excuse act, we say ignorance of law is not an excuse. But the fact remains that you know most people don't understand the law. So even if the court decides something, people are not happy with the decision because something somewhere is missing. And uh, what is that element that is missing? Because what you're doing basically by applying the law, I feel, is that you're you're just treating human beings as objects uh, on whom the, this formula is applied, uh, not as human beings, not as thinking, feeling human beings who are you know, susceptible to their emotions, their feelings, uh, how they look at the conflict, how they look at the dispute, and how look, they look at what they feel is uh, their entitlement. So these are all, you know, th these are all things that are, uh, that, that, that are not at all considered, that are overridden because the, uh, you have to fit it into the framework of the law. So now there, that is where the problem comes. And that is where the system has, uh, has been failing the people actually. Uh, the system has been failing because we have lawyers who, who split hairs. Uh, the more you're able to split the hairs, the bigger you are. So you charge by the hour, you charge 15 lakhs, 20 lakhs for one hour's appearance in the court, just because you're much better at splitting hairs than me. So that, that is what, uh, you know, it, it's become a, a sort of a joke, okay? I mean, if you look at it objectively, the way we, we are fascinated by uh, the arguments of uh, maybe Harish Salve or Pali Nariman, but break it down and see what, what is it that they're actually trying to do. I mean, we have created this fiction. Uh, we have created this fiction and uh, we have attached so much importance to this fiction. Uh, forgetting that essentially we are all human beings and we don't like conflict and our objective is to resolve the problem. 
not to you know perpetuate it or not to split hairs by interpreting the law or deciding what the law says who's interested in that i have a conflict i want my conflict to be resolved so it's as simple as that so there again we come back to a you know our ancient method of having a dialogue having a conversation and what mediation basically does is it simply introduces one more person into the conversation uh, who can take a, a more you know a, a neutral stand and not uh, look at it from the perspective of the parties but try to understand their perspective and help them to look at each other's perspective and maybe you know uh, come to a conclusion that might be in their best interests okay so that is where i think mediation comes in and that's where i feel that in the long run it is going to be a very sustainable way of resolving conflict because it appeals to the essential humanity in us because the the essence of uh, the essential empathy that is lying uh, dormant in us uh, in, in many of us for the simple reason that we are overcome by greed and jealousy so uh, in in my humble view i think what we need to do today is encourage this conversation encourage this process of having a dialogue and uh, that is where the mediators step in so uh, i think that's that's what i feel about the whole thing i think it's always a, like i said always a pleasure listening to you i think what the thoughts that you brought in is actually the base of what i'm trying to put across and but but, but do we have any historical basis that we have in india or otherwise that you looked into uh see the problem is we uh, uh, uh an example that is very often given and uh, this you can see whenever anybody who's not a mediator uh speaks on mediation invariably the example of lord krishna mediating the dispute between the kauravas and the pandavas comes up now whether it fits into the conventional uh, definition of mediation i don't know but you know there, there was an effort what i'm saying is there was an effort to have this dialogue to reach a compromise so in that sense if you look at it technically it may not be mediation but there was a process of attempting to have a dialogue and i think in that sense uh, th- there is a whole lot of uh, literature on that though i cannot claim to be an authority uh, mnlu had recently organized uh, a series of talks by people who have done these research uh, the research on these these dialogues in the indian culture and uh, it, it was i heard a little bit of that and i was very impressed because it's not indian society alone it's basically it, i think it's something very human about you know when see we we invented language we invented communication uh, through words so which no other species in the world is capable of so that's one of the most powerful tools that we have where we can you know translate uh, our feelings into words and express them in words so we are capable of using metaphors to describe what we are going through our experiences so it's one of the most powerful tools you know that this ability to communicate through words is one of the most powerful tools that we have and uh, instead of using those words to you know uh, prove each other wrong or to you know uh, blame each other or to find fault with each other or to quarrel with each other all we need to do is uh, you know uh hone the skill of communication to have a dialogue which leads to understand which instead of you know being confrontational instead of uh, giving in to our emotions and you know that's where the concept of emotional intelligence comes in uh instead of giving in succumbing to our emotions and uh, you know, resorting to a uh, language which is offensive or language that that creates further divisions why don't we have these conversations which can build those bridges and establish uh, a, a better way of understanding each other well i like the aspect that you're talking about the indigenous communities and how they yes. were doing it i think that we need to go back into and understand how that worked and like i mean this is a good point that you made out that where did we go away from that i mean yeah. one is of course colonization definitely that's a totally i mean the colony is supposed to be controlled 
So you have yeah. to put across laws yeah. in a manner where 5,000 people can control 300 million people. <laughs> how do you do that? So that's the way yeah. you do it. So well, that is how uh, Vikram, see, the problem is why, how did we start, uh, you know, creating these fictions? For example, the fiction of a nation, the, the fiction of religion, the fiction of God, uh, the, the fiction of law. See, these are all fictions which are created only to control us, right? Yeah. Because the more we uh, grew, the more we started uh, you know, organizing ourselves. See, uh, what, what, is, what is unique about human beings is the ability to organize ourselves. Yeah. Okay. So I was listening to this talk by Yuval Noah Harari. He says that uh, uh, if you bring a bunch of chimpanzees, maybe say 1,000 chimpanzees or 10,000 chimpanzees and meet them in Times Square, There'll be utter pandemonium, right? Because chimpanzees can operate at a at a microcosmic level. Maybe ten chimpanzees may work together, okay, as a group. But if you put ten thousand human beings in a place, they can still be organized. They will not step onto each other's toes. They will not start attacking each other. Okay, they will not start killing each other. They will not start snatching things from each other. They will be organized. That is our ability. That's our unique ability to organize ourselves. Okay, how did this ability come? Because uh, this book, which I, I'm talking about, the history, uh, hopeful history of humankind, uh, there are there is a discussion about archaeological discoveries, you know, which show that the bones of Neanderthal, uh, the Neanderthal man that was discovered, the broken bone was broken, whereas in the case of Homo sapiens, the broken bone was healed. Now, what does it show? It shows that people stayed back and helped, uh, the Homo sapiens stayed back and helped their group, the, the, the individual in their group who was injured, to recover and then moved on. Whereas the Anandathal was abandoned. So there was a lack of empathy over there. So it is this empathy that you know connects us, right? That that makes us work with each other, that makes us cooperate with each other. But on the, the flip side of it is, the more we are able to organize ourselves, the more we are dividing ourselves. Because he created these fictions of you know nations, religions, identities based on these. Uh, we drew these artificial borders all over the world. Okay, and we said, this is mine, that is yours. So the, the moment the concept of yours and mine came, which was never there when we were hunters and gatherers. Okay, everything belonged to everybody. So that's what uh, Jean-Jacques Husso says that when the first man drew a line on the ground saying that it belongs to him and the, the other man who helped him to plant those uh, you know, spikes and uh, fences, if he had said that, no, this man is a liar and uh, this earth belongs to everyone, okay, and nobody has the right to claim it as its own, uh, that would have been the ideal situation. But unfortunately, people helped him to plant those fences, to build those fences. So we have started, you know, those fences have started expanding and, uh, you know, we have enclosed ourselves into identities. And uh, that is where we create these conflicts. What we forget essentially is we need each other to survive. Today we are destroying the earth, right? I mean, I'm watching this uh, Snowpiercer, a Netflix series, where uh, they, they, there's a train, you know, they make a train. Uh, which is making several revolutions because the earth has frozen over. It's minus 120 degrees Celsius, the temperature outside. So on this train, they, this train keeps on making revolutions. It has 1,001 cars, uh, carriages. And even here, there are divisions. So we have the first class, we have the second class, and we have the third class, and then we have the tailies. So people who have just got into the train, you know, with, by force who did not buy the tickets, who could not afford the tickets, who just saved themselves, just got into the train. So you see how we, we divide ourselves, even when it comes to, uh, you know, the question of a survival. So, Interesting, yeah. But, I mean, that means basically a balance between organizing yourself and not organizing yourself so much that you create those divisions to the extent where you are in some way controlling people, something exactly. like that. Yeah. So that means we have to go down to a basic unit, that basic unit, which is good enough for survival, good enough for your needs, but do not get greed into it Correct. because there is a, enough for everyone's need and not enough for one person's greed yes. also. So yes. I think that unit, so what that unit and what the size of the unit, when do we start doing, going to the level where we divide 
I think that part of it needs to be maybe sociologists will go into that and maybe we'll get something there. But Gunasidan had a good he has a good uh, example to uh -huh. give. He says uh -huh. that there is a tribal community in Kerala called the Manan tribe. They have 133 tribal villages. He says this is a, a, a Tamil Nadu, the Yelagiri Hills. Yelagiri. No litigation at all for centuries yeah, yeah, yeah. exists today. So that means we have an example of a certain mm -hmm. kind of how they're doing it. I think this is where we need more research on like, only yeah. on the aspect of the dispute resolution, not on yes. the larger thing, how yes. they're surviving and everything. Yes. Just on that, I think so. But, but Gurani said, is if there is something you have on the aspect of dispute resolution and how they do it, we can come back to that a little later. So if you have something on that. So that, so that aspect, I think we, we need to definitely, I think this is where, which is what, like I said, this whole idea of the symposium was that. Can we get these yeah. examples yeah. and can we take those examples out and can we use them in today's world or what are the issues in today's world in using those examples? So that's something you have to throw light on. So, uh, see, uh, that's a very good question, actually. Gautam. How do we do it? Do we just leave it to sociologists to do the research? Because there's a lot of research out there. Okay, there are a lot of findings out there. And uh, uh, the question is, how do we spread this message? And uh, I think that is where mediation comes as a very, uh, as a very powerful tool. Because basically, it encourages dialogue. It, uh, see, what, what is essentially different between if you look at uh, the conventional dispute resolution methods, and if you look at mediation, uh, what is the difference here? The difference is we we don't give importance to uh, law here, the, the fiction called law here. We don't give importance to uh, what are the defined rights and obligations of parties under the law. But what we tell the parties is, look, what's important for you? How do you feel about it? And what is it that you would like to do to solve this problem and move on with your life? So the focus completely shifts from the conventional way of looking at you know, rights and liabilities or rights and wrongs. Uh, you shift the focus completely to something that is, that is more, uh, that's more human, that's more uh, you know, within the parties, because that's something that the parties can decide by themselves. They don't need a third person to sit there up on the podium or dais or wherever he sits and tell them that, okay, this is right and this is wrong. So if you are able to achieve that, if we make this as a culture uh, in society, uh, my feeling is we will be answering a whole lot of problems. Because well, I'll tell you one thing that I will, we'll, of course, we will see Guna and will also throw light on that. The aspect of having elders and in some way, at least respecting them and listening to them because understanding whatever experience they have is something that can help you resolve your dispute because they've seen these things happen. So one is, did we lose? Have we lost out on that? And why have we lost out on that? Something on that? Uh, that's a good question again. See, the thing is, the problem is, who are elders? Tomorrow I'm going to be an elder, you're going to be an elder, right? Today, somebody else is an elder. Now, the, here the problem is, you know, if elders have that wisdom to grow beyond their prejudices, what they have learned, uh, beyond the kind of environment they have been brought in, and look, have a larger worldview, and look at things uh, in a, in a, from a perspective of what the young, the young people who come to them actually need, nothing like it. But unfortunately, many times elders are, are steeped in their own traditions, so-called traditions and culture. So, and this is where the problem comes. Like, for example, if, if, uh, if two people belonging to two different religions want to marry, elders form a panchayat, a khap panchayat, and they sit there and they sentence them to death. So now where is the question of elders playing a constructive or positive role over here? And... Uh, when there's a dispute, let's come into a more day-to-day -day kind of a situation where let's say there's a matrimonial dispute between a husband and a wife. Now, the more we sit and observe when we do mediations, we see that elders actually precipitate the situation uh, and make it much worse than what, what it actually was, where all they had to do was just step back and allow the, people, the couple to resolve the problems. 
elders step in and they take sides and they bring in their own biases and their own concept of what is right and what is wrong and they start judging the couple from that perspective the other side okay so this is where you know it compounds the issue the compounds the problem and, you know the the conflict reaches a stage where you know police stations intervene and courts intervene and lawyers intervene and it's a total disaster after that so when we talk of elders yes uh, i do believe that elders can play a very significant role but are those elders uh, properly trained for this purpose are they bringing in their prejudices and biases into the conflict or can they step out of that and look take a more uh, neutral view of it and see what is best for the people who are coming to them for resolution so if the uh, if the elders are going to sit there and give directions and tell them this is what you need to do according to what they perceive is to be right or is uh, right or wrong then the problem comes so uh, i have a little bit of a reservation about elders involving themselves with the disputes for the simple reason that elders are carrying their own experiences carrying their own biases carrying their own prejudices and they bring that into the dispute so how do we deal with that situation because well, how i look at it is one is not the fact that it is all elders i think the community itself is able to churn out those people who it feels are going to be able to balance these things like you said biases and That's prejudices wonderful. so i think did we have that i mean we are sort of saying did we have that or are we still thinking that it was there and we had these people who finally just told them what to do and they were controlling the situation so we have to see in all communities was it like that or there were some communities because the, there was an africa example which was coming mm. in where they said it was actually those chiefs telling them what to do so the way or did be or we have to also look at this that were were we picking out people or in some way electing them i mean communities also elected them like we had panchayats and all that so were we electing the wrong people and that's how things went the wrong way <laughs> maybe that's another thing <laughs> see i i tried to see something on this uh, vikram earlier because i was writing something and uh, in another webinar i was asked to speak on this and uh, i tried to do some research on that surprisingly i came across very little empirical data on uh, these uh, the the, uh, the the role of elders or the role of uh, you know uh, even the panchayats now here again the problem is what we have seen normally okay now uh, like i was you know i was uh, a few years back before i was trained as a mediator uh, this was about uh, almost uh, 20 years back uh, there was a problem a matrimonial problem that i was asked to uh, represent the girl in that and uh, there was a meeting of this jamaat you know the jamaats are the local panchayats in small towns we still have and even in big cities we have these local jamaats to uh, intervene and uh, try to resolve these problems uh, resolve or pre- precipitate the problems depends on the outlook of the jamaat okay now there again what i found was generally either a person who was well versed in the religious scriptures okay and the kind of religious training that is given you know sort of uh, isolates them from the a broader world view because they they learn only the religion they don't learn anything else so the, either those people are there as jamaat elders or the richest man in the locality so a jamaat comprises of i the rich, rich people of the locality along with the so called religious people now i'm not talking this uh, i'm not uh, 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 this is not with reference to only one community but generally what we have seen when we talk about these panchayats is that uh, they are comprised of these two groups okay either the rich uh, or uh, the religious scholars or both a combination of both and they sustain off each other okay they because mutual sustenance and that is how we see the church and uh, state collaboration at one point of time whether it is the christian world or the islamic world or even in india we have found that you know uh, priests and uh, religious scholars play a very important role in perpetuating the power of the king so the rich need these people and these people need the patronization of the rich so this combination can be a very potent and deadly combination 
because what was happening was they were not listening and this gentleman was sitting there supposedly respected elder of that place uh, uh, he was not he was sitting there and forcing this girl to go back to the husband though she was going on telling him that he is not normal and we later came to know that he was actually gay okay nothing wrong with that but then he was in a heterosexual relationship in a marriage which was not working out and these people without understanding that were compelling this girl to go back to so finally i took the decision to walk out of that i told my client i said there's no point in sitting here and talking to these people you're not going to find a solution here so we walked out of that so uh, that has been one experience now another experience has been where uh, there was a business dispute between two parties and uh, this was uh, you know uh, in uh, vijayawada uh, there 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 is the auto nagar over there jawahar auto nagar and uh, this was this was even before i became a lawyer this, this was a dispute involving one of my uncles who had a dispute with his partner and uh, we went there and uh, they said that every dispute would go to this particular mechanic who used to repair the radiators over there okay who was a mechanic basically a mechanic he had a very simple house it had a small compound in the front and uh, he came out of the house uh, he had the portrait of uh, the goddess uh, saraswati outside and he just uh, paid obeisance to the portrait he came and sat down and when i recollect what happened because that time i was not able to see the wisdom of what he was doing but you know when i recollect the way he handled the whole dispute it was actually mediation and motion okay what we call as unconscious competence so without being trained without knowing that this is, there is a something called a process of mediation nobody had heard of mediation at that time in india so he was sitting there and he was listening to both the party okay and he was telling them what would you like to do how would you like to go about it what is important for you what is important for you and i was you know when i think back on it it doesn't cease to amaze me that how beautifully this man did this exactly. so he was a natural he was a natural mediator which is uh, now, yeah now please please so how do we find these people today how do we find these people and these are the kind of elders that we should be uh, looking up to not the conventional you know uh, the kind of panchayats that we hear of the kap panchayats mm-hmm. these jamaats these uh, you know elders from drawn from the church and the and the rich so so no, i think this is the main thing is that you were saying exactly what i'm saying only thing is you don't listen to me in my various shows and everything that i do because you don't get the time exactly that i've i've been saying i'm saying that they are all there they already doing it it's and no, i i i have heard you and i agree with i have also agreed with you yeah yeah but absolutely <laughs> so basically what we are doing is first of all that word they might not be familiar with which is what i put in the theme also they might not be familiar yeah. with the word how does it matter to us they, we don't have it to push matter. a word yeah. we have yeah. to just say that this is a process yeah. that you've been using and yeah. let us keep using it the only thing is are those people getting lost or do we i have been saying that they should make it a profession these are the people we really need out there so how do we get them to make it a profession and in general what we were talking about making mediation a profession itself is becoming difficult for people because of reasons which we will discuss and definitely <laughs> we will we'll how much of it we discuss we'll see and gunasilan also has similar views on it so we would definitely come in is so how do they make it a profession is what i want to ask you and how do we take them forward Yeah, that that's uh, well. That's I think I don't know whether Gunasilan has an answer for that, but uh, what I personally feel is that uh, I think we should uh, you know one thing is uh, see today we are seeing mediation happening at uh, two levels. Uh, one is at a more structured level, okay, uh, by you know through the courts and through uh, you know trained mediators who. Are we were trying to do it professionally though it's not still uh, not become as professional as we would like it to uh, that is at a more structured level and at a different uh, level of society okay now what we are talking about and what uh, you are talking about today is the grassroots level where at the ground level how do we translate this and how do we you no know, uh, you know recognize these potential mediators and you know maybe you know just hone their skills a little more so that they can do it in a more conscious way 
so uh, what they are naturally able to do if they can do it more consciously that would be a much better you know they would be getting much better results so how do we translate that uh, i think that part of it will have to grow organically and that is where i think we need to have these conversations and invite people and you know uh, especially our youth the youngsters uh, which is what you are trying to do and uh, i really appreciate your effort in the direction because uh, you know uh, asking them to go off out and identify because i remember once we were having this chat on clubhouse and uh, two of them were telling about their own experiences uh, about what happened in their own families so uh, that that is what we need to you know we need to continue with this and we need to have these conversations of course at the structured level let it continue as it is continuing and uh, i think we need a proper collaboration with the uh, though you don't like that uh, personally but <laughs> between the courts and the professionals you've touched uh, on it you've touched on it i <laughs> <laughs> i know i was thinking a live wire <laughs> i knew i was i was going to step on a live wire but i couldn't help it i had to say that so so like uh, that, yeah yeah please It's yeah your show it's so, your show i'm just I, i'll come in only when you want me to come no no i i, I please interrupt me whatever you feel like so uh, that at a structured level let it continue as it is okay people like you and me what kind of work we are doing we'll continue to do that uh, gunasilan is there so there are so many organizations now we have iiam we have camp we have fcdr we have kdlx chambers we have so many you know organizations that have come up and they have taken up this work so the idea is to promote private mediation as much as possible and uh, first of all we need to you know uh, bring the lawyers on board and you know try to tell them that look there are better ways and also expand it to include more professionals right? i don't see any reason why it should be confined only to the legal profession because in arbitration if you take for example we have engineers also who are arbitrators we have chartered accountants who are arbitrators so why can't they be mediators provided they have the soft skills that are required for a, to be a good mediator so that is one part of it the other part of it i think is you know we should uh, uh, do more research on this grassroots level how do we develop these talents which are there already uh, there is a huge pool of talent out there and how do we identify that and how do we bring them to the fore and how do we uh, you know professionalize the services so that uh, uh i i somehow am very uncomfortable with this pro bono concept because we always talk about pro bono work i am not very comfortable with that because what i find is uh, that is what happened with the court and expediation why it became a disaster it had a huge potential but ultimately it became a disaster simply because uh, a lot of people felt you know uh, almost every lawyer i know of has an aspiration to become a judge so they thought this was you know one avenue for them to be Uh, you know play the role of judges and uh, many many people i mean there are a lot of people who are doing very good service who are sincere who are devoted who are totally committed to uh, the cause of mediation but there are also some group of course we have all kinds of people so there are also some people for them uh, they are kind of uh, they think there are some ad hoc judges who are there to decide the issues between the parties uh, so what happened was it became a disaster because of this pro bono concept because one when you do something pro bono you always have this very condescending uh, approach you feel that you're doing it free and therefore the whole society owes it to you uh, well nobody compelled you to do it but when you're coming voluntarily society doesn't owe you anything you're just giving back to society what you owe to society but that uh, mind doesn't work that way usually they have this very condescending approach you know that we are doing so much and quality gets compromised in the bargain so that is what happened with the court and expedition so we have a serious issue of quality here uh, the kind of uh, mediations that we see the kind of trainings that are being done today uh, there is an issue of quality i don't mind saying it openly i think somebody has to build the cat from there so that is a reality okay, because, because i'm there i'm yeah. i'm right there in the midst of all this so i know for a fact there is there, there's a huge issue of quality today Well, I'll just go back to what you said, structured and everything. But how I'm looking at it is that, in some way, let's look at India. We must be doing something right that only 18 million matters go into courts every year. In the US, it is 100 million matters. 
So for 300 million people, if 100 billion matters go, and if India became the same, there would be can 400. I, can, can I can I can I interrupt you here for a minute? 18 billion matters are going to the court in India, and in the US, 100 billion are going to the court. It is not because we have done something right. It is because we are doing everything wrong. Because people have lost faith. They live with the disputes. Okay, they would much rather live with the dispute than go and uh, you know knock at the court, doors of the court because they know that justice is going to be delayed and in all probability denied. So it's nothing good about it, uh, Vikram. We have to recognize that because uh, somewhere I I heard somebody uh, uh, saying that zero point four percent of the disputes come to the court. If exactly. if that is a that if that is a fact. which i really could not corroborate but even assuming 9 4% of the disputes or let's say even 10% of the disputes come to the court what happens to the 90% either they go to some extra judicial means like uh, the local uh, rowdies or gundas or politicians or police stations or they just live with the dispute yeah. because they, they 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 feel that it's better to you know just live for, uh, you know grit your teeth and bear it rather than go and lose everything in the court Because I was looking at that when I said something right was to that part of dispute resolution which is happening by people who have that skill already natural ability mm-hmm. and people trust them and they're actually doing it. Now this one part which I was going to bring to you later was with the fact that being a large rural population, one is that we have these people there and as a society. that individual individualistic society might not have developed so much so you have to be part of the community so there might be some social pressure i mean are you bound by that social pressure to the extent that you are are you taking your own choice choice in dispute resolution or you are being pushed into it so that part of it we will definitely have to look at but how i'm looking at it is that if that is happening in rural areas and that is when i say we are doing something right then are we by this structured approach which we think is the one that we want to import was why i was giving you the us example was that in the in the world everyone talks gives the us example but the point is have we looked at what is happening in the us it is 100 million matters going into courts and they say most of them get resolved before trial yeah. but why are they getting resolved before trial because the lawyers have taken control of it they are obviously earning their money in that adr process they don't say that it is for mediation only they say that our adr processes have been they been able to resolve it without trial so now if the lawyers have taken that as the way to control litigation instead of litigation controlling the process they're okay with it and that's how it is working for them cannot be for us because i mean various other countries because 400 million matters for india cannot go into courts so that lawyers can take it into adr it can't happen we will not be able to handle we can't handle 18 million forget 400 million so i think to we have to be able to that structured as we want to put it across and you use the word private mediation i am saying every mediation has to be private the whole court system and mediation connected to the courts is totally a totally different path i mean you went for litigation okay rightly or wrong we, we don't want to hear if i should be comment on it you thought that that was the way to dis- resolve your dispute mediation was not either you were not aware of it which is not correct because that is part of what society has always had it's not that it's a new process but you maybe were not being able to get the right people to do it whatever might be the reason for it like you moved into urban areas and you lost that touch with communities and you didn't have those people so now a court system where the whole concept of litigation and justice through the court being connected to mediation i just feel that the connection is wrong it's like judges in some way forcing people to go for mediation giovanni is here giovanni is from italy and mandate he keeps talking about mandatory mediation i am saying that you the courts cannot do their job they were given a certain work to do they are overloaded for whatever reason is there they have to look at that for that reason to tell people to go for mediation is like i'd put a comment in a post that gula silian had given a comment on some post i replied to that comment and i said if someone goes to the government 
and says that we need a road to connect our village and the person in the government says no you are forced they forcing him no you must make the road yourself if we did, we, <laughs> we came to you so that because you were part of what an institution that was created in this country and you were given this work to do but you were telling us we are forcing us because you can't do it we, you might be overloaded in the kind of things you have to do but is it correct so this person if they say that village goes to the court the court is going to tell the government why are you saying that how can you say that they'll get into that the bureaucrat will be called into the court sit there for maybe a day nothing will happen he'll come again and he'll keep doing that and the same court is doing the same thing our job we can't do but we are going to tell you to do something which you can do on your own which we are which is nothing connected to what we do that just the connection of these two i just find why did why are we why is it happening it's not natural so it will never grow in the way it has to and the larger concept of developing a developing a profession is the only sustained way of dispute resolution going out to people but the profession is getting finished like you said pro bono it's basically the court has a self interest that the matters do not get the court doesn't get clogged so we want you to resolve it yourself so the whole i mean the whole idea of okay we want it pro bono we'll we'll fund it also i mean we'll fund it also the point is why is the tax payer funding people's disputes why should the government be funding the community mediation centers in in the, the us those mediators are paid but the people are not charged why is a tax payer paying to fund the, someone's dispute you don't fight yeah go home just say why are you fighting so the tax payer has to fund you you are the one fighting and i have to go in in some way pay through whatever pay a mediator because you can't resolve your dispute yourself so i'm saying there is a lot of things in this structured approach which we call the structured approach instead what how i'm looking at it which i told you earlier also was that we identify these people upskilling them definitely a person like you to is required if to have to upskill those people but upskill the right people we what we are thinking is that this factory this is a 40 hour factory come there we'll make you a mediator which is what i keep saying that these shows that i do is to bring out that this is not maybe these mediators have been they over time they have, they are what they are it is not they went into a factory and they came out as mediators so i think this we have to relook that the whole concept of how we want to take this forward i mean we really have lots to be able to okay some country did a certain thing at the certain point of time but has it worked for them itself so yeah no uh, see there is a uh, you have a way of looking at it uh, vikram but uh, see the hard reality the ground reality is that if you take india's example we have more almost 4 crore cases which are pending in various courts okay now to say that courts have to decide those matters without referring them to mediation may not be the right thing because why should courts not because parties would have come to court without knowing that there is a uh, there is a possibility of getting those disputes mediated now giovanni is here and uh, uh, i would request him to correct me if i am wrong italy is following and what is called as an opt out model where it makes it mandatory for the parties to go for at least one session of mediation before they come to the court and it has been a i think it's been a great success because uh, from what i understand from what i heard somebody say that uh, there are almost uh, 70% of the disputes are getting resolved through mediation am i right uh, jivan you wanted to say so Giovanni can't say anything. He has to type it in the comments. Giovanni, you have to oh. type in the comments. We don't have time because Dimitri is here. His oh, session starts yeah. in six minutes, yeah. so we can't. Uh, so what? What? What I'm saying is, one is you know, mediation organically developing the way you you are conceiving it, which should be encouraged, and I think which is really the right way, and it 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 is in the long term it is going to pay its dividends. But at the same time, I uh, I find it difficult to agree with you. that the court should not refer uh, parties to mediation maybe the way the system is working today can be changed maybe you can charge parties for mediation supposing there's a big commercial dispute now why should these two rich companies uh, expect the taxpayer to fund the dispute resolution so that way i agree with you that yes the courts can say that okay you have to go for mediation 
uh, go for at least one session of mediation or two sessions of mediation. And if you're not able to resolve, come back. So that way, the mandatory mediation part of it can be made to work, provided they pay the cost of the mediation. They should be made to pay the cost of the mediation. Uh, yeah. no, but, but look, what I'm saying is that the no. courts and mediation are totally diametrically opposite ways of dispute resolution. I come to a restaurant. So why do, why do you, my question to you is, why do you wish to look at it that way? Because ultimately, look at it from the concept of dispute resolution. Courts are there to resolve disputes. Courts are there to decide the disputes, or if the courts feel that it is not necessary for us to decide this particular dispute, because this dispute has the potential of getting resolved through a process of mediation, through a collaborative process. What should stop the, why should anything stop the courts from referring? They are not shirking the responsibility. Well, they, all they are saying is, okay, there is an easier way of doing it. So maybe you don't know about it, go and find out. No, and if what. it works for you, well and good. No, Jawad, I'll correct you on that. I'll tell you because hmm. uh, AFCON's judgment in India said that the pleading should be complete when you have to send it for mediation, yeah. which is what we understand that up till the point that the pleadings are complete, positions have been taken to that extent. The lawyers have created pleadings yeah. in a manner that they have divided yeah. the parties in such a manner. Mm. They can never sit uh, across the table. They've, the, the allegations and counter allegations which they've put in the pleadings is never going to let the parties go. So they have to do it much before that. I mean, much before they even go to a lawyer. Forget the facts of getting into court. No, that, so, that, is, that, that is the ideal situation, Vikram. Uh, My question is, what is wrong that even after the pleadings are completed, if the courts want to refer, if they see an element of settlement over there, if they see that there is an ongoing relationship between the parties, or if they see that you know there, there is a potential that the parties can negotiate and settle the matter. See, that is the job of the mediator to move. They might have taken positions, but it's the, it, that's the challenge for the mediator to move them from their positions and bring them to focus on their interests. So I don't want to challenge we are again them. becoming... <laughs> I don't want to challenge them. So, no, I tell you, well, I, I'm not saying, look, what I've been saying is that just put a board outside the court, say that we deny justice because that's justice delayed is justice denied. You can, you will, if you come at the risk of losing your time, money and peace of mind, the Chief Justice of India goes out and says that mediation should be used. Damn good. I mean, I like that. But okay. at the same yeah, time... Uh, on, on, sorry to interrupt you. On your idea of a board, instead of saying justice is denied here and therefore go to mediation, what if the courts say that if you want complete justice, go for mediation? Here you will get justice exactly. according to the law. <laughs> exactly. Here you will get justice according to the law. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. Whatever way you... But also at the same time, tell them, look, we can't do the job that we uh, you want us to do uh, that resolve your dispute by yeah. the judge taking a decision. We won't be able to do that. We are totally clogged. And 20 years, it's a human right violation. 20 yeah, years if the is, summer... And who, how are they accountable? No one can ask them anything. The point is finally that if a judge is also is overburdened, can you actually give the justice that is required? And can a person stay no, that, in jail? That, that, uh, J uh, Vikram, that is, the, that is the very pertinent question that you have raised. Okay, now that is something that the institutions have to answer. Okay, now what I'm saying is, now I'll just give you a small example. I, I always give this example because it happened uh, very recently in a mediation where uh, this party walks in. It is referred by the court again. It's a landlord and tenant dispute. And this party walks in, the landlord walks in and says, sir, why should I come for mediation? What power have you got? I'm told that you have no power at all. So why should I sit here? You're not going to decide this for me. So why should I sit here? I said, that's a very good question. I said, now, before you came here, who had the power? He said, the judge had the power. So I said, now the judge has given you the power and said that, okay, this is your problem. You have the power to resolve it. Go to this fellow sitting over there and he might help you to resolve this. Now, the choice is yours. You want to use that power to find a resolution or you want to go and give it back to the judge and say, no, thank you. Please use the power. Okay. So he sat down quietly and we proceeded with the mediation. I think what so, you started, yeah. What you started off with the whole thing that the way why did courts come up and all that, I think we'll have to definitely go into that. Only thing is Dimitri's time starts now, so I will have yeah, to ask so, him to come in. Yeah, Dimitri, I please. Don't, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> yes. Hi, Dimitri. Hello. Hello. Good yes, to see you all. 
Yeah, we will not go beyond. They, we will take your time because with Jawad and me, the conversations can go on and we'll keep doing that. And Guna Silan also had things, but we won't be able to take it. We'll start your session. Just give me one minute. I'll have to stop this recording and then we'll start your session. Give me one second. Okay, Jawad, thank you very much. Lovely talking to you always. And we'll definitely take these conversations forward. There are a lot of things we agree, disagree or whatever, but at the end of the day, some good <laughs> thing will come out of that. So thank you very much.